Okay, let's start the first course, uh, DeFi infrastructure. So what we'll do, um, actually four different uh, modules. The first module uh, is the history of decentralized finance. And it's got a number of components. It's actually interesting that decentralized finance has got rather a long history. It's not just the last few years. Uh, we'll explore the nature of money and this idea that money can have tangible and intangible value. We will um, give an overview, a brief overview, of the problems that um, are endemic in centralized finance, or CFI. And we'll go into much more detail on that uh, later. And uh, we'll talk about early CDFI, so that's centralized, decentralized finance. And I'll let you know what I mean by that at the point. And, um, and of course, the crypto uh, origins. The second module uh, is DeFi Foundations. The third addresses in much greater detail uh, the problems that DeFi solves. And the fourth module has to do with the popular myths uh, about uh, decentralized finance. And I'll try to go through and uh, explore each of these myths and, uh, and, and give you a better understanding of what actually is happening within uh, this space. So let's start uh, with the first module, the history of decentralized finance. So evolution, and I really mean evolution. It's been quite a while in terms of decentralized finance. And if you go back in time, think about the earliest method of market uh, transaction. It was barter. And interestingly, barter is a peer-to-peer -peer technology. So this is, this is essentially the first uh, decentralized finance, where we've got peers interacting with each other. But the early barter was very, very inefficient. So uh, you want a cow and you've got two goats. You need to find somebody that's got the cow and wants the, the two goats. So very, very difficult. Indeed, um, what actually happened was that a system of credit uh, evolved or gifts it was called, where you would give somebody uh, something and then they would give in return at some other point uh, a surplus of what they actually had. Again, this type of market economy, very uh, inefficient. So uh, the main inefficiency was the matching problem. So you had to have an exchange that made sense to both peers. So money, was introduced and it largely solved uh, the matching uh, problem. So, so let's kind of go through uh, the purposes of money and uh, I put them into two groups. So one is a unit of account. So this is a way to compare uh, the value of different uh, goods and services. And number two, which is the most important um, quality, is a medium of exchange. So this allows us to get around the barter, that we can use money. So I put as secondary, but many people put as primary, uh, a store of value. So this is the idea that you could sell your good for money and effectively store that value. Uh, if you kept your good, it might spoil. So it allowed for uh, some savings and insurance. And uh, the fourth uh, attribute is a transfer of value. So uh, it, it actually makes it very easy with money to transfer a value or to defer value. So what about the characteristics of money? So number one, it needs to be durable. So 
ideally, you can use it multiple times. And coins, um, for example, are very durable. Uh, paper money or plastic money, as we have uh, largely today, um, that is not as durable, but there's a system of recycling so that um, the old paper uh, is replaced with new paper. Uh, portability. So you need to be able to carry it around. There's some exceptions here that I'll talk about, but uh, a very important attribute is just the ease of use. Uh, the third attribute is divisibility. So we all know that a dollar can be divided into 100 cents. So fractional units are important also. Uh, uniformity is also uh, an important attribute. Uh, basically, one dollar that was printed last year has the same value as one dollar that's printed uh, this year. Uh, the next one is limited supply. So we, I think, have a good intuition as to what happens if supply becomes unlimited or near unlimited. And we all know the stories of severe hyperinflations, whether it's in Weimar, uh, Germany, or Brazil, where uh, when the supply gets out of control, then the value or the usability of the currency is greatly diminished. Another attribute is acceptability. So the US dollar within the US is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And that means that uh, you need to be able to accept the US dollar by law. Okay, so that's a very powerful uh, characteristic for uh, US currency. And the last one is stability. And this is a, a subtle uh, characteristic which we will address in this course because cryptocurrencies are in general not stable. But the idea here is if the currency is very unstable, then people will look for alternatives. Okay, so these are the basic characteristics of money. And uh, this is an example of uh, the portability characteristic. And people talk about returning to the gold standard, or some people uh, talk about that. Gold is not very portable. And this actually shows uh, to move uh, like a lot of gold is extremely uh, difficult just because of the weight of the gold, uh, let alone the security that's involved in moving it from one vault uh, to another vault. Okay, so let's do a very quick history of, uh, of money. So we'll start about uh, 9000 BCE with a barter uh, economy. And we know a fair bit about this. It's even portrayed in various uh, pictures that have survived uh, to this day. Okay, so as I mentioned, this was very uh, inefficient. It took a long time, but uh, gold coins were uh, introduced about 600 uh, BCE in Lydia. And this solved many problems uh, that were uh, caused by the inefficiency of the barter uh, system. So these coins actually have value. So they have tangible value because gold, even back in 600 BCE, was used for other things. It was used in the arts, as it is today. Indeed, 70% um, of the gold uh, that is used today is used in things like jewelry. So gold actually has a tangible value, whether it's for jewelry or technology or dental work. It's got other uses. So banknotes uh, came uh, from China, and Marco Polo indeed introduced the idea uh, to Europe. And they, uh, uh, again, uh, have a long history, um, but this was uh, kind of the first paper 
uh, currency. This is a special one for me. Uh, 1871 is the date of the very first wire transfer by Western Union. And this is an example of what it looked like. So the actual paper has been preserved. And what I'd like you to notice is the amount, $300, but there's also something else that's kind of interesting in this transfer, and that is the fee. Notice the fee is $9, 3%. So this is 150 years ago. And even today, we've got essentially the same situation. You swipe your credit card, 3%. You send a wire transfer, 3% or more. So it's remarkable to me that we've gone 150 years without greatly reducing our costs. And this, again, motivates uh, where we're going in terms of decentralized uh, finance. So credit cards uh, introduced in 1950 with the Diners Club uh, card. So they've been around uh, for a while. Uh, 1967 is the first uh, ATM. And that was uh, introduced by Barclays Bank in London. Telephone banking, which is kind of routine today, reaches back to 1983 with the Bank of uh, Scotland. Internet banking, uh, not surprising, uh, came from California. The uh, Stanford uh, Federal Credit Union offered for the first time a way to do banking um, via the internet. So contactless uh, payment, this was introduced by mobile uh, in the form of its speed pass. And it's kind of an interesting uh, application um, because swiping a credit card at a gasoline station actually is very risky for the credit card company because often when a credit card is stolen, the first place that's tried is the gas station. And the fees associated with uh, a credit card swipe at a gas station um, traditionally much higher than, let's say, a restaurant, like 5%. So mobile, realizing that they could basically give you cash back and still be far better off than if the customer swiped with a credit card. Um, chip and pin was introduced in 2005. It's uh, interesting uh, to me, given the insecurity of credit cards, that the PIN part is largely not implemented in the United States. 2008 is a big uh, year. This was in the depths of the financial crisis, and we will talk about this in much more detail in the course. But in 2008, a famous white paper was uh, put on the internet by Satoshi Nakamoto. And we don't really know who he or she, or whether it's a group of people that authored this paper. Nobody uh, knows for sure, but we do know that this paper was transformational, a highly impactful paper uh, in finance. And we would go through uh, some of the details in that paper. To be clear, this course is about decentralized finance and mainly focuses on Ethereum and uh, applications off the Ethereum blockchain rather than Bitcoin. But nevertheless, we will talk in some detail about Bitcoin. It is the first a cryptocurrency and a bellwether. And indeed, its market capitalization is uh, is roughly half of the value of all cryptocurrencies. So this was an important innovation. And we know uh, in 2014, uh, Apple Pay was introduced, a much more secure way 
to do uh, a credit card because you're using facial uh, recognition or a pin uh, directly, whereas in the U.S. at least, um, people uh, aren't required to use a pin. So the deal that Apple got with the credit card companies was a very good deal because any, any payment with Apple Pay is much lower probability of a fraudulent uh, payment. Um, so the world of blockchain really exploded in 2020 and 2021. So essentially all leading banks have blockchain initiatives. They know now that this is not a niche product. This is something really serious. It is a serious threat to their business model. And indeed, the CEO of Goldman Sachs said, assume that all major financial institutions around the world are looking uh, at the potential of tokenization, stable coins, and frictionless payments. They're not just looking at it. They have teams of people trying to figure out what they can do. They realize that they have to reduce costs. It's unacceptable what the costs are. And the competition via the decentralized finance space is, is after them. So uh, there's also, we'll talk about uh, in the course, uh, a lot of regulatory risk. But in general, regulators that are at least economists realize that reducing frictions, reducing transactions costs, making transactions more efficient, that's a good thing. There's a lot of things, well, actually almost everything in economics, you can get one side versus the other side. There's very few things that economists agree upon. But one thing that they agree upon is that if you reduce transactions costs or frictions, that's a good thing for the economy in general, for everybody in general. So there have been many positive initiatives and indeed uh, the OCC uh, has granted permission to use stable coins as a more efficient way of doing transfer. And we will talk in detail about what stable coins actually are.